All right, here we go. Salute to NBA Nation on this Monday afternoon. Matinee edition of the NBA Report, man. CP the franchise, Alex Chitaros on the ones and twos. Special guest. You can catch him covering the NBA for a number of properties, including the Dan Levitard Show and Oddball Hoops. He is my guy. And also NBA Radio on Sirius XM. He is my guy. I mean... L. Hassan joins the show. On today's show, man, we're going to go around the league, talk about the latest news and rumors, Giannis's comments about the Bucks, we'll talk World Cup, the Knicks lawsuit with the Raptors, among other things, man. Looking forward to this show. So lock in, hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, and share this video. Another edition of the NBA Report, man. Me, welcome to the show, man. How you feeling today? What's going on, fellas? Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's been a long time, long time coming. It's right? been a long time coming, man. So absolutely a pleasure to have you on. We did talk a, a, a for a bit in summer league in Vegas, but what, what does the off season typically look like for you, and how's it been going so far? Well, it's not a typical off season. We launched a new show called Oddball. Thank you for shouting it out. Um, we launched it actually at summer league, and so we've been going uh, basically four days a week, Tuesday through Friday with the show and what would usually be a lot less hectic a time has been a very hectic time trying to launch a show trying to get it right and get it make it sound the way i wanted to sound and look the way i wanted to look has been it's been a challenge and so it's eaten up most of my summer you know usually it would be coasting until right about now we watch a little world cup and that'll take us right into training camps and and so on and so forth, but I haven't really had that kind of downtime this year. And speaking of World Cup, USA just beat Greece today at the time of this recording, 109-81. You got Canada steamrolling their group. Have you been able to tap in with the action? What's been your impression so far? Yeah, a little bit. You know, uh, Team USA, obviously, it's a, a roster of guys who've never really played at this level for Team USA before. Um, so they're all trying to find themselves, but I think it's a really interesting mix. It looks more like an, a regular NBA team, and I don't mean that in a in a disparaging way, but usually Team USA is like an all-star team, and it's a bunch of guys who are superstars where they're from, and they all got to come together and figure out who's going to do some of the dirty work or the heavy lifting. And instead, they got players who maybe some of them have star potential, but they're not uh foreigners to or they're not like uh unused to the idea of doing the dirty work of playing a role even a guy like Jalen Brunson you know this is a guy who two years ago was a role player for Dallas and you know kind of found his star turn in New York so for many of those guys whether it's Mikael Bridges Cam Johnson Austin Reeves they're all used to playing up and playing back you know and and taking a step back and it's an interesting kind of roster construction. On the other hand, we see Team Canada, and it looks like, you know, for years we've been talking about, well, Canada one day is going to put together this team. When you look at how many Canadian players around the league are excelling, and it looks like that day has finally come yeah. because they're, they're, they look dominant. I mean, I've been enjoying watching Team USA the way that they construct. I think it's a little refreshing just because mm -hmm. you don't – have those personalities that you were talking about, right? It's not like a Steph Curry or LeBron James trying to figure out, all right, who's going to go for 40 tonight? For all of this, what we've seen in the last couple of games is that anyone can stand up right now. Anyone can drop points. Ant-Man, Jalen Brunson today, you know. Uh, the only one that seems to have a little trouble uh, adjusting is uh, B.I. with his comments most recently. But I think it's been great to watch these guys perform. And I think it's a new way just to get the young core, the young group of the NBA getting acclimated and transitioning potentially into that star potential that you're talking about. So I like what Team USA did this uh, this year for, for the World Cup. Yeah, and, and to, you know, to address what B.I. is talking about, it's different, man. Like, people think, oh, basketball is basketball. Yeah. It's different. The rules are different. The spacing is different. The physicality is different. I think a lot of people still have this, um, this uh, kind of notion that, oh, international basketball is soft. Yeah. We're the tough yeah. ones. When in reality... NBA basketball, you're not allowed to touch anybody. Everything right. is moving your feet and positioning and help defense. And over there, they're hand-checking, they're grabbing, they're holding, they're shoving, they're doing all that stuff, that 90s and uh, early 2000s type basketball. So it's actually the opposite. It's a lot more physical playing internationally than it is 
playing in the NBA. And I could see how, again, this is the part where the lack of experience. Guys have never been through it. This is like a rude awakening for them. Yeah, de- definitely a rude awakening. I think they should have no problem getting out of their group. Let's see what happens when they get into the second round. They start playing some more experienced teams, some teams with size because rebounding hasn't been their their strong suit. But as you mentioned with the physicality, that's why I feel like Brunson has been so important to this team. I mean, Steve mm-hmm. Kerr has been talking him up at nauseum to, to a certain extent, but he's been very important to this team. He adds a different dynamic than Halliburton. Likes to be aggressive today, very aggressive against Greece, but likes to play play physical on both ends even though defense isn't his calling card he'll still put his body out there and and put it on the line but I feel like Brunson's profile in the NBA and and amongst the the media the fans and so on I think it's only going to elevate just being with Team USA and some of those snubs the all-star snub the all-NBA snub that he got last year maybe makes it a little bit easier to make those to get those accolades this year with this uh with this stint in the World Cup yeah, I think, well, there's two things that happen. One is what you're talking about, which is the exposure puts a higher kind of, of appraisal from the world. It's weird. It's kind of like, you know, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're in high school, you're going, you're dating, but it's, you know, okay, whatever. Then you go out with the it girl and all of a sudden, like, whoa, <laughs> you're going out with her. Like, now it's like, it's elevated you. I'm the same person. Ain't nothing happening. Ain't nothing different. It's just. You see me in a different light now. You think I'm different, but I'm the same. But the reality is that um, for Brunson, he really did take a leap from backup guard to Luka Doncic to that playoff series where Luka was hurt at the beginning and showing the world, hey, I can, I can step up. I can do more. Going to New York and really, I would say, changing the culture. You talk about the All-NBA all and All-Star stuff. I, I thought anyone who watched Knicks basketball last year, I defy anyone to tell me that he's not their best player. Unquestioned. Yeah. In the same way that, you know, I worked for the Phoenix Suns a decade and a half ago. Amari Stoudemire led us in scoring and, and all that, and he was a great player. But I don't think anyone could watch the Suns and say he's their best player. Our best player was Steve Nash. He mm-hmm. made everything go. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm not ca- comparing Julius to Amari or, or – or uh, JB to uh, um, to Steve, but it's the same kind of way. Like I don't care what the stats say; that's their best player. They go as he goes, uh, so that's part of it. But I think also the thing that we've we've seen throughout the years is guys who go and represent their country uh, in World Cup and in Olympics. When they come back, they come back with a renewed, stronger Stronger. sense of confidence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, oh yeah, I I am that guy. I, I. I am a peer of the great players in the world, and they come back playing a lot more confident. So I'm interested to see how Jalen Brunson comes back from this experience just in terms of how he feels about himself. Definitely. You got to put his name up there with like guys like Brown, Tatum, Booker. Uh, I think even Zach Levine, too, to an extent, who played for Team USA. He's got, all those guys came mm-hmm. back, and you just see them take another step in their development and their game. I'm looking forward, especially for as a Knicks fan, to see what Brunson can do in. I don't know what other level he could take because he was just that phenomenal last season. You know, CP and I were talking about it on the last uh, over at KFTV uh, next week. We were just wondering, you know, what would be another step outside of just playmaking that we want to see more from Brunson. But that requires everybody else to take another step forward. Like seeing him off ball for the Knicks, that would require someone like quickly Grimes, even Julius to take another step forward in their playmaking for him to be that off ball guy. Like what we saw in Dallas, but. It's just I don't even know what that next one would be. It's it's well, I mean, you talk. It's those guys growing in awareness, and I I've been talking about it really since that Knicks Heat playoff series. I said, when you watch the Knicks. There's a civil war going on. They they may not even know it, but it's the guys that know how to play versus the guys that are playing off impulse. I feel like shooting. I feel like that. Yeah, that's not going. That, that'll win you regular season games with talent, but when you get to the playoffs and it's about execution. That's the stuff that shoots you in the foot. And so even when you look at what the Knicks did in the offseason, like they went out and got Dante DiVincenzo. That's like, we need more guys like that. Like the, you know, and it's it's kind of uh you know, it's a it's a little bit of a joke now. They'll get us another Villanova guy, but the Villanova guys know how to play. They make the right play, they they make the right reads, and as a result, they get to be better than what they would be individually. Uh, and so it's on those other guys quickly and Grimes and, and Mitchell Robinson and Julius Randle to 
take a step of, okay, I've been playing the game. Now I need to start thinking the game. I need to be more cerebral in the way I play. Um, and if that happens, I think the Knicks can take a step forward. If it doesn't happen, I think we're going to see more of last year. Mm. You know, times when it looks great and times where it's like, what are we doing? Yeah, uh, absolutely, man. Good, good. Yeah, I guess. What would you put that put that on? Like, would you put that on a little bit on coaching too? Like for the coach, for like Tom Thibodeau to implement more of that cerebral aspect of thinking and that awareness. It's. I mean, it, yes, to an extent, you know. But at the end of the day, it's on players to want to play like that. You know, I, I think one of the examples I use was, I want to say it was, game either game three or game four. It was in Miami, and the Heat caught out to up fast start there's a big lead and then like uh, quickly came in and he hit a couple of threes and brunson hit a couple of shots and what was a big lead was still a large lead but it's like they're chipping they're doing the thing that you you want to see in the playoffs let's just be solid make right plays over here execute and we'll chip away chip away and then it's a game get it to single digits before we go in and a half and they got a steal and Randall came down, and as soon as he was dribbling, I was I was turning to the person sitting next to me. And I said, "He's shooting this one." <laughs> like there's no, there was no part of him was like, "Quicks hit two, let's we got to get him going," or hold on, let me get Jalen, come get the ball, let's run something here, let's get we got a a nice transition, uh, a nice uh, stop here, let's get a bucket. He's like, "Nope," he came down, jacked him a three because it had been four, three or four misses. He put up a shot, it misses. He rebound, come back down, hit a three. And then it's like, here we go. The avalanche starts all over again. And so Hibs could call 100 plays, and we could talk about it in practice all day and film sessions and all that. If a guy in that situation doesn't say, what's the thinking man's play here? If a guy says, I got to, oh, I got to get a shot up. I ain't shot in a while. How do you, how do you control that? And unfortunately, when it comes to Randall, you're not talking about, your seventh man, your eighth man, your fourth starter. Someone's like, hey, man, that was a dumb shot. Come sit down here. This is one of your two best players, so they kind of have to go along with it. And maybe you talk about it in timeouts, and, and we know that he's not always the most receptive of in kind of in-game counsel or advice, but that's that's the world they live in. And at some point, I guess what I'm saying is he's got to be – able to look in the mirror and says, I, I need to be better about this. I need to con- be more in control and, again, think the game more rather than just play off of impulse and feel. How do you? How did you like R.J. Barrett in the playoffs? He's another guy extremely polarizing uh, in terms yeah. of opinions, not just among Knicks fans, but among the NBA world. Just who exactly is this guy as he enters into his, his fifth season? His rookie max deal yeah. or rookie extension kicks in this year. What's your thoughts on RJ going into year five? Yeah, for me, uh, RJ is a guy that I think really needs structure. And sometimes because of that, half the game is or half the team is playing off an of impulse, RJ gets caught up in that. Or, oh, okay, I, this is what I got to do. I don't think <clears throat> he's good improvisationally. I don't think he's good cross tween tween that's not his game he's a guy that needs structure coming off of down screens pin downs posting up smaller guys getting the 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 switch to get those mismatches i think he needs that when he plays in that kind of system that kind of structure i think he's very effective you know a lot of people may kind of you know cringe at this or whatever but like i think harrison barnes with the warriors like Mm. that's the kind of player he he can and should be in a better even a better version of that um in terms of being able to score i like his fearlessness in that regard yeah uh, you could put him in any situation he's going to get after it i love his defensive tenacity but i think the biggest thing is right now he plays a style that's not that i don't think that's a good style for him i don't think he's an improv guy i don't think he's a just give him the ball get out of his way kind of guy i think he's a guy that will really structure for more more set plays and more kind of we, these are where you're getting your shots here, here, and here. Hmm. We're so with that, creating more structure, and more set plays. I got to come back to the tips question again, because this is a guy mm-hmm. that's not necessarily an offensive create an offensive creator. 
right? Um, mm -hmm. So how would you, if you were the Knicks, solve that issue to get RJ in those type of sets? I mean, I, I think it has to be a, a, a point of emphasis going into camp that we're going to have more structured offense. That doesn't mean we're going to slow everything down and hold everything. We get transition opportunities, we're going to get out there and run. But once we're in the half court, I mean, again, I another name to look at is look at um, look at Jimmy Butler, who RJ I think is a better shooter than Jimmy Butler, but Jimmy's whole world is coming off of those down screens, catching in his kill spots, going to work in places and situations that benefit him. So he's getting to the free throw line, or he's getting to the front of the right. rim, or he's getting a good open look from the mid range, uh, which is his strong suit. You know, and then from time to time, he's got that open three. He'll take that open three, but that's not really what he's going for. RJ is a better perimeter shooter. But again, how do we limit the dancing with the ball for him? And how do we get him to, hey, one dribble, two dribble, three dribble, get to my spot, rise up and finish or get fouled? That's the thing. But again, it starts with are we emphasizing that in camp and are we holding people accountable? Again, when we're calling stuff and other guys don't want to do that, then that's another issue you have you have on your hands. How often does that happen in the NBA where like a coach calls something and then a player goes like just starts freelancing, does their own thing and it's like what are we doing over here? It's it's rare when it's like that. It's like straight up disregarding that usually means the coach is probably he's out of there. Last leg. Yeah, he's out of there. But a lot of times what happens is we call for a certain action and guys will do it but they won't execute it well i'll give you a, a real generic simple example there's this place that called floppy guards that or when guy stands under the basket you got a big here you got a big here and the guard is supposed to come off of that screen and depending on what the defense does that's he reads right so if the defense is locking and trailing then he's curling around the screen if they try to shoot the gap and cheat you fade and it's and then the big can come back up and screen or it can seal. There's a million things you can do out of this very simple action, right? The way you're supposed to do it is you come up, you run, you rub shoulder to shoulder the wing guy off of the screen because you don't want to leave daylight. Daylight allows the defender to wriggle in. If I'm disillusioned with the play, I might go lazily around that screen. So I'm leaving lots of daylight and I'm coming around there and nothing's happening, right? That's just an example of, hey, this is the play we're going to run. Okay, all right, whatever. And then you run it and it doesn't work. It's like, okay, now it's broken down. Let's let's play ISO. Let's 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 improv off of that. So you, you get, if guys aren't bought in, and sometimes it's not a conscious decision. Sometimes it's literally just, lack of attention, lack of attention to detail, lack of focus, and they don't realize what's happening. But again, I think the great teams, the teams that take that leap, they're able to execute. They're able to do the stuff they want to do and stop you from doing the stuff you want to do. And if you watch the Knicks in the Heat, I don't know how many people would say the Heat were this overwhelmingly talented team. They're just a team that executed. Yeah, like, We're going to run something, we're going to run it, and we're going to run it right. And if you're not running it right, you're going to sit next to Spo, right? And meanwhile, the Knicks were kind of just out there, you know, out there and talent gets you only so far. And so even a guy like Jalen Brunson, who I praise, and I think he plays the right way and all that. You think about that turnover at the end of game six, that's because there's no execution happening. That's a guy who was just going and got to a place where, oh my God, I'm, I'm cut off and he's trying to make a play and turns it over. And that's what happens when nobody's on the same page and nobody's adhering to a structure. Mm. Good, good points, man. Once again, we're talking to Amin L. Hassan. So to everybody in the chat, hit that like button, hit the share button, and subscribe to the channel. NBA reports happening on Monday, August 28th. Uh, sticking with the Knicks, you know, last week the, the Knicks made some, some noise in the NBA with bombshell allegations against the Raptors, a lawsuit against the Raptors, and a former video coordinator, Ike Azatam. The Knicks allege that Azatam stole or, or took proprietary scouting files, videos, plays, player breakdown, so on and so forth, using company information to send it over to the Raptors, where he was going to have a, a new position with the Raptors. I had Mike Vorkanoff from The Athletic on the show, and we were kind of breaking it all down, and 
I think if what they allege for, from as a, of that Azatam did is true, I think they could have a case against him just in terms of violating their terms of use mm-hmm. or using their corporate assets to send over information that they deem confidential, top secret, whatever the case may be. But the question is, from your perspective, do you see the scouting material, the player breakdowns as and such as something that, that they could really go after the Raptors for in terms of espionage or, or you know, what have you? So this is what I'm going to say. I'm going to say two, two things. Number one, I'm not a lawyer. I've never been to law school. I've never taken a pre-law class. I don't know what the court law says. So don't quote me on that. Number two is the details that I know are based off the reporting of Mike Vorkanoff and Fred Katz. So mm. the stuff that was alleged to have been removed and, and transmitted, I'm going off of what was in the story. If there's something else in there, the secret ooze, shout out to my guy, Elite, who loves... <laughs> shout out to Elite, yeah, of course. You know, the secret <laughs> ooze, I, I don't know about that. I'm going off of what they're talking about. What they're talking about was uh, a potent and scouting report, I believe for the Indiana Pacers, and Synergy file. Yeah. Let me start with the Synergy file. Synergy is a software, if the listeners or viewers don't know, it's mm-hmm. a software that basically allows you, you log in, and I want to watch basic video of NBA teams, international teams, college teams, what have you. So if I'm saying like, hey, man, if my coach comes to me and says, let me see every single Joel Embiid post up, I go on Synergy, and click Sixers and click player Joel Embiid, and under him has got different play types, cut and spot up and pick and roll man and uh, roll man and pick and roll ball handler, post up. And then I click on post up, and it gives me a playlist, basically, of every single play that Synergy logged as a post up. I say it's basic because no, most teams are trying to find, hey, man, get me every time they ran four pop wing or whatever. Mm-hmm. Synergy isn't doing all that. It's just the generic post up, spot up, cut, pick and roll, ISO, et cetera, right? The problem is, if not 30 teams, maybe like 28 or 29 teams in the NBA have synergy. So a coach asking his video coordinator in Toronto, give me the Embiid post ups, is exactly going to get the exact same result as Coach Vogel coming in in Phoenix and telling his video coordinator, get me the same thing. And the same thing as Coach Ham in L.A. asking his video coordinator to get him the same thing. Or Coach Malone in, New- in, uh, in Denver, et cetera, et cetera. So while in theory it is proprietary because you are paying for your Synergy subscription, everyone's got it. It would be like if I went over to someone else's house and used their Netflix. I have Netflix. Am I going to log out of your Netflix and log into my Netflix? To watch, or am I just going to pull up something? There and technically, again, am I sh- they sharing their login with me? Maybe, maybe not. But the spirit of what's happening here is not one of theft or one of oh, that's mine. It's kind of like, yeah, we all get it, we're all subscribed to this thing. The other side of it, the opponent scatter report, opponent scatter reports come in like basically two pieces one piece is a personnel report, one piece is the uh advanced scout, the, the, the play calling. Personnel report is basically like Tyrese Halliburton really likes to get to his left hand. That you know, mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. It match his energy. He wants to make plays, et cetera, et cetera. And then I'll have like his stats from the last five games and maybe his stats from the last time we played him. The play calls will have the thing where every team has advanced scouts. They go and they watch the team that we're going to play like down the line. So I'm the Knicks. We're going to play the Pacers seven games from now Mm -hmm. i got an advanced scout who goes to pacers at bucks Mm -hmm. he gets credentialed by the bucks he gets a seat by the pacers bench and he sits there and he's like rick carlisle horns whatever and he writes it down and then he sees what happens he draws up that play and they do this for every play call that they go through and then they send these plays back to the team the video coordinator gets with an assistant coach who's been assigned the pacers he's watching their last four games before we play them. And then they're basically taking the play calls and attaching them to the video, creating a video playlist that they then show to the coaching staff. They whittle that down. They showed that whittled down playlist to the team. They whittle it down some more. They show it to the team 
on game day. Like these are the three most important things we have to watch out for. That's an advanced scouting report. Every team is doing this. And again, the advanced scouts a lot of times because they're, they ne- they never they live in a hotel room for 300 days they're traveling around a lot of times they're just trading play calls with other people so hey we play sacramento in like nine games uh you guys are playing the pacers in you know nine games as well you're watching the kings at warriors hey send me the kings calls i'll send Down you the, the calls. yeah yeah like why are we going to do why are we going to reinvent the wheel because again in the nba everybody knows every play there's no secret plays that are blowing everybody's mind for the most part we know what's happening. We know who's going to get it. Like, can you stop it or not? Can you, can you stop him from getting to his spot and scoring? So there's no, again, there's not a real feeling of proprietary information when you're talking about an opponent scouting report. So again, letter of the law, I don't know. It sounds like it could be or whatever, but materially, does this help the Raptors? Even if they stole it from the Nuggets, the champs of the league. Even so for the Warriors, they're like the most unquestioned dynasty of this last decade. It's still going to be around the same stuff. Now, it's, if you're talking about scouting reports of like actual personnel scouting reports, of like we're targeting Tyrese Halliburton in a deal and it's got his likes and his dislikes and, you know, what he's like off the foot. All right, that's different. That's intel. That's, that's mm. sensitive, top secret information because it's based on something that isn't passed around but opponent scouting reports are passed around and uh synergy is synergy is synergy it's 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 for everybody so i say all that to say when i saw this story and i read the details i was like is this simply an opportunity to letter of the law to go after people former employee uh a rival an interdivision rival rather than an actual material breach that puts the Knicks at a great disadvantage and puts the, the Raptors at a great advantage. Now, it seems like this could be a, a, a petty James Dolan uh, lawsuit here. What was, what was your take on it when you, when you heard it? <laughs> I mean, hearing what I mean just said about all the information and, and the details of, like, you know, scouting reports and using um, Synergy, it doesn't seem as great as it, as I read it, like because not knowing all the details and the inner workings of like what goes into a player, uh, a scouting report and stuff like that. It sounds great, man. Like it sounds like very detailed information that shouldn't be going to any opposing team. Right. But if it's stuff that everyone has access to and it's not that great of it, then it just does sound like what you said, CP. It sounds like James Dolan being petty. Um for whatever reasons maybe it's just going yeah. for a divisional rival or maybe it's you know they, they said it was it was blowback from the uh bargnani trade thanks glenn yeah, Gr- right. Grunwald. it was a bar- <laughs> <laughs> the, the hibbert stopper so, bargnani man that that one went well that yeah like was it eight years ago whatever but 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 at the same time like let me just say the act of taking files isn't i don't want to make it seem like everyone's cool with it it's it's an uncool move, right? But it is not an uncommon move. I've I've heard stories of guys taking our playbook, not ours in Phoenix, but mm-hmm. like the team taking the team that he worked for, the 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 actual playbook, our plays, and then going to his new team, and then someone from the new team calls the old team and say, "Hey, man, we're not about that life." This dude, I should tell you, this dude took your stuff mm. because because that is like okay now we're getting into you this is our stuff on our wrinkles and and the things that we we like to get out of it which is always going to be more nuanced and defined than just someone watching us play so it's not again i i, I don't want to make it seem like ah whatever man go ahead take it. it it's not cool that part but it's also like i said not materially something definitely not something where you see people taking other people to court no one's going yeah. to court over it. It just, it feels a little frivolous on that side. The synergy stuff to me is just like, it doesn't like I, if someone was leaving and say, Hey man, I got to go tomorrow and I'm going to download a shit ton of stuff off synergy. Like, have that. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. Because it's, it's it, like, it's saying, Hey man, can I download something off your Netflix? Like, knock yourself out. Yeah. 
And it's like, I've seen like, Synergy before, so I didn't know if it was something where, like, you know, NBA teams have a different license, more functions, more features, it's, so on and so forth. But, but not n- nothing that rises to the level of, like, ours is better. The only thing I can think of from having Synergy that would be compromising is if someone was downloading our search history. Mm. Like, what are they looking up? Yeah, right. right. What are they focused on? That's different. Now you now it's almost like uh it's like Facebook. You're yeah. you're not just taking the the my likes and my dislikes on my Facebook page. You're watching my behaviors and now trying to create predictive yeah. uh, analytics or whatever off of my behaviors. It's like when you buy something on Amazon, it says, you know what you really need? You need one of these. But like, wait, how'd you know? How'd you know? Because uh, yeah, your your purchase history is informing them. That's another level. But if we're just talking about he downloaded Kyrie Irving ISOs or or Mikhail Bridges off of down screens. Again, that's it it is as frivolous as it gets when it gets when you talk about that. So so the report by Fred Katz and Mike Warganoff said uh it's the proprietary information was scouting reports, play frequency reports, a prep mm-hmm. book, and a link to third party licensing license software, which and I would synergy. assume that's synergy right, right there. So mm-hmm. when you hear play frequency reports and a prep book how would you feel about that though if someone took that so play frequency again if if i'm assuming it was opponent stuff not our stuff our stuff i would yeah i'll be like what are you doing right but if it's hey he got that the pacers run horns double 17 percent of the time all right congrats like again like this isn't yeah. i feel like <laughs> that's like second spectrum stuff that anybody can get like, but pretty much, like I, I let me put it this way: if Ike was really pressed, he literally could have called almost any advanced scout in the league and said, "Hey, man, can I get your play frequency sheet for the Pacers?" Except yeah. obviously, someone who worked for the Pacers, and could have got it that way. It, that's that's what I mean. Where it's this isn't like, "Whoa, this is this is my cornbread. You got to get your own." Like, it's community mm-hmm. stuff when you're talking about that. A prep book is exactly what it sounds like. So if we're gonna play, um, typically during the, the regular season, you just don't have time. You don't have time to do a whole lot. So, and a lot of it is, you know, within 24 hours, well, I played this team and we're moving on and we're moving on the same thing. So it's going to be a play frequency sheet, a one sheeter of scat, uh, opponent scouting reports, which is literally like three or four lines a guy. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, whatever video stuff we're doing off of that, like we're going to have the plays drawn up for their most frequently run plays. When you talk about the playoffs, it's an actual. I wonder if I have mine here. No, I don't think so. It's it's in storage somewhere, but it's like it's an actual book. We're going. Everyone gets a full sheet of player personnel stuff. Uh, we've got all their plays, all their out of bounds plays, all their uh, after timeouts, all the mm-hmm. under out of bounds, side out of bounds, all of it. We, we got all of it, and it's a booklet, and we're handing it out to everybody. That's for playoffs because we're going to be playing the same team four to seven times. Yeah, It's going to be in depth. So if it's a prep book for regular season, it's almost like a pamphlet. If it's for playoffs, it's going to be more detailed. That I think would be a little bit more kind of taboo because that's something that a lot of work went into that. And it is going to be more that is going to be more signature to each organization. Mm-hmm. They're going to have theirs or whatever. But again, I, I, I don't know, you know, it's like some of the things in the, in the lawsuit are alleging that it's because uh, coach Darko has never coached before. He's, he's a novice. Coach. <laughs> uh, the guy's been an assistant coach for three different NBA teams. Yeah. Well, well, and not to mention his coaching career overseas. Trust me, like th- he wouldn't have got the job if these basic elements here were brand new to him and he needed he needed help like that. Well, once again, we're talking to Amin Al Hassan. So to everybody in the chat, hit that like button, hit the share button, and subscribe to the channel. Another edition of the NBA Report. Uh, let's talk about Giannis, man. And because Giannis mm-hmm. had a nice uh, <laughs> New York Times article written about him and his brothers and his off-court endeavors and 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 his journey as a whole, uh, but he was asked about his future with the Bucks and and potentially signing the three-year extension that he's eligible for, worth one hundred seventy-three million dollars. Now he said here in the Times, he said. Uh, 
Um, I would not be the best version of myself if I didn't, if I, if I don't know that everybody's on the same page, everybody's going for a championship, everybody's going to sacrifice from, from their family like I do. And if I don't feel that I'm not signing, he also goes on to say, uh, you've got to see the dynamics, how the coach is going to be, how we're going together. At the end of the day, I like all my teammates. I feel like all my teammates know and the organization knows I want a championship. As long as we're on the same page with that, you show me and we go together win a championship. I'm all for it. He says, the moment I feel like, oh, we're trying to rebuild, and then he and then he switches up his tune. He says, at the end of the day, I want to win, and I don't want to spend 20 years with the same team and don't win another chip. What do you think about those uh, those comments there by the Greek freak? Welcome to the NBA, Milwaukee. I mean, this is <laughs> you got a star player. You have to keep convincing them that you are you are desperately trying to help them win a, another title. Doesn't matter how many they've won. You, Golden State, they had a number two overall pick. He wasn't panning out. They said, "Get him up out of here, yeah. man!" Like. We're trying to win another one. It's like, well, yeah, but this guy in seven years, they don't want to hear about seven years. They want, they want to hear about titles now because this is what I said on the radio the other day. Brooke Lopez and Drew Holiday and Chris Middleton and all these guys and John Hamm, um, they can end their careers and wherever they go, people are going to say, that dude won an NBA championship. That guy's a champ and get respect and never have to buy a drink and all that stuff. If Giannis goes the rest of his career without winning one, all they're going to say is, you just won one? Only one. You just won one? That's it? Steph got four. LeBron got, you know, four. Kobe had five. Shaq had four. Michael had six. Magic had five. You, you just had one? Man, get your ass to the back of the, of the greatness line. And so he's living under a pressure that nobody else, not even his brother is going to feel. Nobody else feels that pressure. So the other thing that happens a lot in NBA teams, particularly when players, star players are demanding is if the star guy is a quote unquote, good guy and a good pro and all that teams, he's fine. He's just playing hardball. He's just frustrated a little bit, but he'll then when he calms down, he'll be fine. When we start playing, he'll be fine. They make these excuses because they think basically they can take advantage of your kindness. Mm -hmm. And so star players have to always remind them, don't take this for granted. Oh, I'm, I'm he'll always be here. We can take our time figuring out this stuff. He'll be fine. He's a given. Just write him in in stone. No, 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 no. You don't write me in in stone. You you make sure that you understand that I'm in pencil and I got an eraser in hand. And I wonder if what Giannis is realizing is coming off of looking at Damian Lillard and right. everything he's done for that organization. Obviously, they haven't won a title, but he's done everything but. Same thing like Giannis, a pro's pro, a great leader, a great teammate, a great community guy, all these things. Given the best of years of his life to this team. They're not getting it done. They're clearly not getting it done on their end. He asks to get traded. He becomes a villain overnight. Yeah. And Giannis is saying, wait a second. Hold on. What if they try to do that to me? So I think from a standpoint, he's just letting them know, don't think this thing is sewn up. It's not. Because they can offer him a uh, an extension in a, less than, a little less than a month. Yeah. So... With that in mind, he's letting them know, don't, don't, don't just think I'm just going to sign from the one side of it of like, you guys have to prove to me that you're doing everything it takes for us to be competitive for a championship. From the other side of it is, economically, it really doesn't make that much sense. I think I, I did the math. Mm -hmm. I think the difference between how much the extension is worth versus if he waits and opts out and signs a three-year deal with another team, not with the Bucks. I think it comes down to about twelve or thirteen million dollars mm. total over the span of a three years. So it's like Giannis has hit, hit a point where he's made enough money where he can afford a thirteen million dollar total pay cut, which is about four million dollars a year, to end up somewhere he feels more comfortable 
with what they're what the program is about. Yeah, I, I think he's in an interesting spot, man, because as you said, he, he's certainly right. I agree with him to send that message to management ownership. Don't rest on your laurels. We have to stay aggressive. We have to stay in attack mode. And they were to a certain extent. They pushed all their chips in the middle to bring in Drew Holiday and it bore fruit. They they got themselves a championship mm-hmm. when, when they beat the Suns. But now the challenge becomes how do you extend that window with your stars, with your primary investments, going in and, and giving Giannis a supermax. You know, the Lakers are looking at that now, right? They sold their soul to the devil to get AD. It got them mm-hmm. that championship. Now they're trying to figure out how to how to maintain that window at Golden State. But, you know, with, with the Bucks, I have a hard time seeing how they're going to be able to do that once Holiday leaves. And Drew Holiday, is, 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 is he going to retire? Is he going to extend with the Bucks? You have Holiday, Middleton, and Lopez over 30. I have a hard time seeing how they're really going to be able to keep that window open. It's good now for another two to three years, but they have no promising youngsters. The stars are over 30, except for Giannis. I don't see how they get there, man. It's going to be very tough as a small market team. And you got to think that Milton has been dealing with injuries recently. Mm-hmm. So how can you even be confident that he can stay healthy for a full season and give the same production that he gave a few years ago to win that championship? I mean, that's going to be the difficult part because if you don't have the capital to go get a young guy and even find a replacement for Middleton, who would even be a good trade partner, at this point with the extension that you gave him saying, Hey, we'll trade you Chris Milton. So that way we can upgrade on our end. Like Mm -hmm. you have to go give up something in return. If you see Milton on the downside, going on the downside, like you got to give some draft capital maybe to get that upgrade. So I don't see how Milwaukee would be able to do that. I I think, and this is why this job isn't easy. And this is why, and you know, you say, well, how's Milwaukee supposed to do that? It's like, if I'm honest, do I care? Do I, like, I care either get it done or I'm leaving. That's all That's all it comes down to. Is like, but we can't do anything because we gave up all those picks for this and they're all tied up. And, like, that's not my problem because the reality is this. The Milwaukee Bucks first year was, like, 68, 69. So they've been around 55 years, right? If this NBA thing keeps going, they're probably going to be around for another 55 years as well. Giannis' career is this. It's a moment in time. The Bucks can go 20, 30 years and then come back and again, it all it becomes a great story, right? Like the Cavs winning the championship. They can mess up for decades, then have everything line up and win that title, and everybody gets to pat themselves on the back. But this dude's career has a very definitive end that he, maybe he feels like is in sight now as he's, he embarks on his 10th season. So I don't have time to have this long view of the world like you do. My my lifespan is this. In the same way that like an oak tree lives or 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 a sea turtle or whatever lives for 150 years. So any given day of their life or or month of their life is like yeah, whatever. It's just a moment in time, a snapshot. Versus a housefly that lives about two days. Yeah, every second matters to the house fly because, man, yeah. this is a big percentage of my life. Whereas for a, a, the sea turtle, a month isn't even doesn't even register on the radar. So if you're Giannis, however great you are, it's I don't I, I don't get to say I'm gonna just wait. I'll, I'll they'll figure it out in a couple of years. Otherwise, you end up like Dirk, right? Like Dirk playing twenty years, and that's cool and. And that's it's sentimental and everything, but there were stretches of Dirk's career where Dallas just fucking up, trying to get shit right, and they couldn't yeah. get it right. And what does he have to show for? He's got one title, and so Dirk, great player, Hall of Famer, all good. Do we talk about Dirk the same way we talk about Larry Bird and Steph Curry and Magic? Do- no, you over there in that you in that group over there with the, with the ones <laughs> at the kitty table at the, ones, <laughs> at the <laughs> kitty table at the kitty table and Giannis is like I don't want to be at the kitty table I want to be with the big people I want to be at the big table so yeah man he's got he's got to do that regardless of whether they have the wherewithal to do it or not now now I mean you you worked with the Suns so how do you mm-hmm. and you mentioned earlier like the you know Brooke can be happy cuz he's got one championship right maybe even Drew Holiday got one championship 
You talk about the organization, they can be, you know, we can go 50 we, years and say, you know, we can come back and revisit the whole championship thing mm -hmm. later. But Giannis's window is short, right? Working in an NBA organization, how do you keep everyone on the same page after you just won one then to make sure everyone's still motivated? Because as you already said, you don't want to lose that star. You have them for such a short window. Well, I think it starts with having a star player who has that mentality, right? Steph Curry, uh, Giannis, again, and I'm I'm naming names, not necessarily if they've won multiples or not, but you could tell when the guys that are hungry that they're not they're not satisfied with one, and it starts with that because that guy is going to be the leader in the locker room and is going to be the guy that when he does when he shows up on day one of the next season, everyone's like. Oh, we're not celebrating this anymore. One of the greatest speeches I ever heard, it was Magic Johnson talking about Larry Bird. And he was talking about, well, we beat the Celtics in 85. I, uh, he said, you know, champagne and confetti, and, and we started celebrating everything. And he said, I turned and I looked out of the corner of my eye, and I saw Larry Bird walking off the court. And I saw the look on his face. He said, I knew. He said, so we partied that night. We went to whatever. We partied for a couple of nights. Oh, I took a week off. And at the end of the week, I came back and I was in the gym working because I knew somewhere in the world, Larry Bird was out there shooting, trying to beat. Yeah. Like he, he gave himself a week, a week to celebrate a title. I believe that was the first time the Lakers had ever beaten the Celtics in franchise history. Pretty historic, monumental. It was Magic's third title at that point. One could say, hey, man. You've done you you you've, you've done it. You've climbed that mountaintop. You got your revenge. You got more titles than him. You you know you're clearly one of the best to ever have done it. Why did Magic come back a week later and start working like his life depended on? It, it starts with that guy right there, right? Then obviously you you hope your coaches like that. Most coaches are. They're just paranoid. They always think that they're about to get fired, so they're always working hard as a result. And then you start to get like, right, the other people in the locker room, are they, are they about that? And if they aren't, then it's on the front office to make those hard decisions of, all right, we need to get guys who are hungry. Sometimes it's just the addition of someone who hasn't won one. So uh, at Houston 95 is about bringing in Clyde Drexler. Drexler yeah. And Clyde being desperate kind of got everyone back on, oh, yeah, we got to do this. Because he wants one. He hasn't won one. Um, but, the, like, the more extreme part of that is sometimes some people got to go. Vernon Maxwell had to go. Mm. And he didn't have to go because he was complacent. Vernon Maxwell had to go from Houston because as Sam Cassell is rising, and obviously Kenny Smith is Kenny Smith, Vernon Maxwell becomes an odd man out. Otis Thorpe had to go because as Robert Ory is a much better fit next to Hakeem, Otis Thorpe becomes the odd man out. And guys, when they win the title, Pat Riley wrote about this. It's called The Disease of Me. How, yeah. like, everyone starts to kind of, like, where's mine? All right. Everyone's down to sacrifice for one year. Sacrifice to win the title. Now, sacrifice over. Where's my stuff? Where's my, I want more shots. I, I did less because that's what y'all asked me to do, but now I want to do more. Where's my money? Where's my new contract? Where's uh, disease? I mean, you look it up. It's it's a really interesting set of kind of principles that when you read it, you're like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. And so when you that starts to seep in, you have to make tough decisions of removing some of those elements sometimes. Sometimes it's just adding new people to kind of give that, that, that kick to everybody else. Um, but if it exist in the front office i don't know man i, I don't i don't yeah. know now mm -hmm. you're in trouble and that and that's why you need a superstar who ain't, a, ain't afraid to shake the cage so yeah. to speak because if he feels like the people upstairs are kind of chilling now we're in real trouble because who who's gonna hold anyone account yeah it, it's very interesting man how, how they build this going forward and and what the thought process of the bucks will be if they're not able to extend that window because you go out, you give Giannis a Supermax, Holiday 
he goes down, right? He's coming off off of his prime. Maybe he retires. Brook Lopez has a couple of, of years left. We'll see what Middleton does with, with his durability concerns. And then are you looking at a potential Dame situation where you have your superstar player, but now you're surrounding him with young players who are okay. You're trying to figure it out, but you, you, you no longer win your championship window. I wonder if the Bucks look at it as, hey, do we look to part with this guy sooner than later? get more assets, right? A lot of people say Portland, they waited two years too late to trade Dame. Mm-hmm. Do we yep. do this now while he's still at the top of his game and just start over as a small market team? I think if you're the Bucks, you can't do that right now because, again, this is a team that had the best record in the conference yep. a year ago or in the league, right? If you look over the last, since 2018, 2019, they've been the winningest team, I believe, in the NBA. Uh They've had their fair share of ups and downs and stuff in the postseason, but they've been consistently excellent without an actual declaration of I'm not coming back. I don't think you do that. This basically what I'm trying to say, it's not Portland. Portland wasn't winning 55 games a year, 60 games a year and losing because, uh, you know, uh, you know, someone got hurt. Yeah. Portland's it was a middling team. And I think we all recognize they didn't have talent outside of Dane. And the talent that they did have was du- was a duplication. Anthony Simons is talented. CJ McCollum is talented. Norm Powell is talented. None of these guys are like a compliment yeah, to what Dane does. Dane. So like Portland was poorly managed for years. I would say Milwaukee has been well managed, but like boys to men sing, there's the end of the road, man. Like we come to the end of the road. Like at some point, you got to realize it's only so many more shuffling of the deck chairs on the Titanic I can do. But you keep doing it until the player gives you the hey, thanks for the memories. And then, out. I mean, in my mind. Then you do it amicably. You're like, you know what? He wants out. Thank you for the memories or whatever. You don't sit around and blow smoke up people's, you know what's, because you're trying to convince them that, oh, this is, we can still do it. We can still do it. I think that's you just wasting that guy's time. And I don't think that's right. Especially when you know, like, it's going to take a miracle, given the, the assets or lack thereof that you have in order to turn this thing around. Well, once again, we're talking to Amin L. Hassan, covers the NBA for a number of properties, including the Dan Lebertard Show, NBA Radio and Series XM. And check out his new show, Oddball Hoops, on the DraftKings Sports Network. Uh, a couple more quick ones for you, Amin. You know, the state of the industry, man. We, we just heard just last week it was announced that uh, on a camera on a mace. It is what it is podcast signed a major bag yeah. with Underdog Sports. Makes me want to go back and tear up my contract in Underdog Sports and start over for the upcoming next season. But nevertheless, shout out to them. Well, CP, could, yeah. are you about to drop a track, though? Because that's the thing. No, they no, no mixtapes. No mixtapes. And then Cam dropped a track, too, with it. <laughs> so there, I'm sure there are some more particulars in that contract that, that just the show. Uh, but but you have them. You have, obviously, Dan Levitard left ESPN a while ago mm-hmm. to start up Metal Arc. You see the hybrid type of format that ESPN is rolling out with, with Pat McAfee. Uh, mm-hmm. you, you have all these networks now. What, what do you think about the state of the game? Cowherd and the volume. What, what do you think about the state yeah. of the game right now? I, th- I think it's, it's great because it used to be you want to work in this business, ESPN, Fox. NBC, CBS. That's it. If you're not working for one of those four, you're not getting your content viewed anywhere. Right. Um, and beyond that, you're doing like local radio or if you're if you're lucky, like satellite radio, or whatever. And now you see that personalities can be built, they and content can be created outside the confines of those mainstream places and really can push what the content should look, sound, and feel like. So McAfee's a great example. Yeah, he has, he's at ES, excuse me, at ESPN, but that was after he left, yeah. did his own thing, signed with FanDuel, and ESPN had to write a, a ridiculous check, in part because he's doing something that they don't have anyone who can do because they're stuck in their ways. 
and they had to go outside to find that new hotness, so to speak. Yeah. And, and you know, everyone from more than an athlete to all the smoke to knuckleheads to Gil's arena. Yeah. They're all do. If you, the crazy thing is like, if you watch every single one of those things, they're all different. Like Gil's arena is not like knuckleheads. Knuckleheads is not like all the smoke. All the smoke is not like more than an athlete. More than an athlete is not like McAfee. McAfee is not like Levitard. Levitard is not like, so everyone's got their own style and they're finding their audiences wherever their audiences are. And that in turn allows other people to kind of carve up those. I'm, I'm a beneficiary. I'm part of the Levitard universe, but then I get to carve out my own audience from that yeah. and try to grow that and cultivate it and be my own thing. I do a show that's not like Levitard. Um, and, and if I was at, still at ESPN, I wouldn't have those opportunities. They would tell me to go sit there on that on that desk and Perk is over here and, and Arthur's yeah. over there and take your turn. And, Wait in and line. We're doing, a reg, we're doing a regular show, which is fine. There's not wrong. I think there's a place for everything. But I think the new landscape allows for a lot of different opinions and a lot of different ways to express those opinions more importantly and then when you look at what cam and mesa like that to me is that's the ideal is that yeah. it's a show that's unapologetically them it's there it doesn't sound like anything else it doesn't look like anything else um and it's funny and it's interesting like i, I think that's the thing that people forget see a lot of podcasts and and a lot of them factually are good and and intelligent conversation and all that stuff but it's like it's boring <laughs> like like I, I i you know like i might listen to portions i might listen to excerpts i might i, I joke about this a lot of time with my friends I said man if your podcast had transcripts i'd love it i'd love to read it <laughs> i want to listen to it though i want to spend the hour or an hour and a half or whatever I never feel like that with Cam and Mace. Every time I put them on, I am entertained the whole way through. I'm laughing. I'm th I'm sending stuff to people, et cetera. Same thing with with, with uh Gilbert and uh and Josiah yeah, Johnson. Josiah, yeah. It like they put a and by the way, it doesn't even mean they're right. Mm -hmm. I mean it's the other thing that people gotta re recognize. Like Gilbert says stuff like I disagree with all the time. I think people are so caught up in like well, he's always wrong. All right. That's not the point of the show. The yeah. point of the show is, can you entertain while delivering these opinions? You hope these opinions are solid or educated or 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 based in fact. But if they're not, at least be entertaining. And I think that's what a lot of these things do. I don't know if Gilbert Arenas could ever exist working for CBS. No, no. Yeah. Cam and Mace would never get a deal at ESPN, right? It's because... That doesn't fit what they want. So rather than say you guys have to change in order to fit what they want over here, be you and then see what it attracts. And apparently it's a, based on that deal, CP, it's attracting a lot. It's working, right? it's working it's man. It's working. It's working, yep. Ooh. They're, far, they're very funny and entertaining. I like it. But it's just so interesting that the way that you talked about it and how the media landscape for especially covering sports has changed where it's like it, I remember just flipping on ESPN, like it, everyone had to come up with like some sort of sound logic and like everything in their analysis where it had to hit on all points. But now, you know, cause I, I listen to arena. So I'm just like, yeah, I don't know. It's just so interesting. I, I guess I want, the big question is like, how big is that audience pool for everybody? Right. Because I can't, I'm not somebody that goes into arenas every single day. I'd be like, all right, I can enjoy this. And just be like, for me, I need to, like, for me, like I need some sort of like sound, like sports yeah. opinions and stuff like that. For sure. Alex, this is what I would say to you. I would say it's not so much about the quantity. It's the quality. It's meaning give, I'd rather have 30,000. Oh, Siri, shut up. Uh, I'd rather have 30,000 uh, motivated listeners than 300,000 passive listeners. I have 30,000 people who's there like clockwork listening to, you know, downloading every episode, supporting my sponsors, clicking the, you know, the, the promo links, doing all that stuff, engaging when they're watching my stuff, 
they watch most of it versus 300,000 watch the first 30 seconds, two minutes. All right. I, I get to just and, and get out. And I think that's the big thing is that as independent content creators, that's what we're striving to do. We're tr striving to show the money people, hey, I can deliver an audience to you who will buy your product, who will patronize your services uh, versus a bunch of people that, huh, okay, and then keep moving. When it comes to like sound logic and stuff, I think that's where, that's where I think it gets tricky because I do think if you are at a mainstream place like ESPN doing a mainstream show, you have a duty to do that to a certain level of integrity. You have a silly show, literally, this is just a silly show. We're messing around over here. Then you get to be silly over here. But if you're doing a daily NBA show, for example, I don't think you get to be silly like us or like, uh, what's his name? It's like Cam and Mace or like Gil. Mm. You don't get to be silly like that because you are a, a league partner. And when people turn on Gilbert Arenas, they understand this dude's having a go. He's having fun with it. But when people turn on ESPN, they think they're consuming news. So I think it's that's the, it's like the difference between watching CNN flagship news show versus watching the Daily Show. The Daily Show is a is a is a comedy. They're making fun of the news. Mm -hmm. CNN, Fox, MSNBC, they're reporting the news. So you can't look over there and say, "Oh man, those guys have so much fun and they're getting good ratings and stuff." You know what? We should do our stuff like them. Like, no, because they're not even trying to be serious. They're not trying to educate or inform the public. They're taking real news stories and they're they're having fun with it. You got your you guys' job is to actually inform people. So when you start to have fun with it and abandon the actual news telling and like go for the joke. You get into dangerous waters because people can't tell the difference. Yeah, most of the time. True, indeed, man. And and you hit the nail on the head. You know, there's a book called um, I think it's a hundred or a thousand true fans, right? And and it's it's really appropriate for this climate of media because you don't have to tap in or try to capture the lar largest market because everybody's mm -hmm. niching down. Everybody's going to that personality or that brand or or whoever because of who they are for that authenticity and you know there's so many different revenue streams to tap into from your advertising your sponsorships and activations your, your events your live shows you've seen guys doing a lot of live shows your merch so on and so forth you tap into various different revenue streams you don't have to worry about trying to get a million people as long as your thousand diehard loyal followers are tapping into everything mm -hmm. that you're doing they're supporting everything that you're doing they're supporting your journey most importantly uh, that, that's why I think a lot of people, there's space for a lot of people uh, in, in the game. I think there's space for a lot of yeah. people. Yeah, and it's, and it's by the way, it's not, I kind of feel like the music industry had this before us. And I think stand-up comedy had this before us as well, where music industry it used to be, oh, I want to sell 10 million records, and I want to, you know, go on to, you, you, trying to be like, 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 like Cam and Mace in their former life, yeah. right? And then at some point, because of the rise of the internet, it became, no, I could be a niche artist. I could just support my fan base. We're going to come out, support me on shows, buy the merch, uh, you know, and and support the, the journey, like you said. And I could do pretty well for myself and even grow it. You think about either someone like Tech 9 or someone like Cole early in his career when he was doing Dollar in a Dream concerts. Literally for a dollar, you could go see J. Yeah, Cole perform. Yeah. Everyone said, that's crazy. Why would you do that? It's like, well, you're reinforcing the people. Like, I don't care about all the people who say they don't listen to my music. I'm doing it for the people who do listen to my music. And it creates this frenzy where these people will buy anything with Dreamville on it. And they will consume anything that you are associated and affiliated with. And it grows to a point where you're one of the biggest music stars. And then on the comedy side, same thing. It used to be, I need an HBO special. I need a Comedy Central special. I need a Netflix special. And then the guys started realizing, yo, I'm doing, I'm putting my clips on Instagram and YouTube. I'm getting good traction. I put my special on YouTube, get good traction. I'm selling. 
I'm making money off of this. I'm selling merch. Why do I need, you know, Andrew Schultz was the first one that told me this, like 2014 or 2013. He's like, why do I need to get co-signed by that? By that. Yeah. He said, I, I know I'm funny and I know people are willing to pay because I see it every night. So if that's the case, then I'm going to just keep doing that and playing to those people and to hell with mainstream comedy. And, and he's become one of the biggest comedians in the world now as a, as a point. I'm well, going to ask this to both of you. Yeah. I got, I got a question for both mm-hmm. of you. Because, and it's funny to me because I just think about my parents, both immigrants, talk to me like, you know, my dad, his, his pops had a furniture store up uh, upstate New York. My mom would always talk about, you know, furniture back in the day used to be handcrafted. You used to, you used to get the quality. Everything was good. Now you just go, I won't say any manufacturers. Mm-hmm. Now you got to put it together. It's, mm-hmm. it's whatever piece of cheap material. It's not the same. But it's kind of feel like we're going that same direction with content creation, music, where you're talking about you're getting quality over quantity. I mean, as as you mentioned, mm-hmm. do you how far? And this is once again for both of you. How far do you think until we get? Do you think it'll go fully into that quality beats quantity, or do you still think we'll have both those things? Because as of right now, we're seeing like. The rise of the content creators, right? Where you say ESPN, like they look for numbers, 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 numbers. Mm-hmm. But when you look at someone like Pat McAfee, it is numbers and and quality that he gets mm-hmm. there with that fan base. So, do you think we're going to see a shift to just pure quality, or we're going to still have this balance between quality and quantity? I I'll go first. I don't think we'll ever see a, a pure shift because the reason why quantity exists is because it's easy. Easy, yeah, yeah. And people always take easy over good. So in mm. terms of, hey, do you want to do something easy? Do you want to do something good? And I'm like, but the good one, I got to work? Oh, we just do the easy one. That's what pe- that's people's approach a lot of times. So you're always going to have most of the stuff out there is going to be easy. Yeah. It's going to be quantity. It's just getting shots up. And then you're going to always have the places that are like, no, we're going to do it well. And... Those are going to be the minority, but you hope those are the places that are going to get rewarded for being good. Yeah, I, I think it, it's never going to switch back. Um, I mean, there's, the barriers of entry is just so low, and there's so many mediums uh, to put your stuff out there on. All you need is, is a camera, and, and you're live. You have your own brand. You have your own broadcast. You see the attention to to, to the attention spans have have dropped. TikTok is taking over. It's YouTube Shorts. It's Instagram Reels. I mean, if I look at how you know my my teenage nephews consume content, he's just doing this. That's all he does. He's just going through Reels, short, 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 mm-hmm. short, all type of basketball stuff. But you know, I, I think that's just that's just what it is and, and where we are. It's still an exciting time, man. Okay, yeah. I just yeah. I, for me, I'm always been about quality. So hopefully, uh, I know it's difficult. But there's just something where it's like, I know I can go turn on a quality product over, just get like numbers and fill out the stuff like that. So I don't know. That's one of the reasons yeah. I tuned into KFTV at the beginning. Like before mm-hmm. my entire thing, it was like, it was all about the quality, man. Cause there's other shows out there, you know, other people, first iterations. And it's like, all right, you know, being the first is cool, but quality takes it, you know, a long way. Yep. True, true indeed, Absolutely. man. Well, I mean, we got a great show. Definitely yes, appreciate you giving us the time, man. Appreciate all the insights and uh, good luck this season. Hopefully, we can catch up over the course of the NBA season. Maybe we'll catch up in Vegas for the in-season tournament where the Knicks oh, yeah, are taking the- on the uh, the Charlotte Hornets <laughs> for the NBA Cup. We finally win something. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'll see you there. I'll bring, I'll bring elite, and I'll bring the next time. We got to bring proof. Yeah, I don't know if he told you about proof. We got to get proof with us. Too, yeah, man. He's next level. Shout out to Elite. Shout out to Proof. Shout out to the Rhyme Animal. Chuck D in the chat. Never misses a show. So shout out to Chuck. Uh, I'm in. Let the people know where they can find you. Let them know where they can find Eyeball Hoops. Just give them, give them the rundown. Oh. Oh, oh, easiest thing. Just go on YouTube. It's all on YouTube. Levitard Show, Oddball Hoops, either one of those. You search for that. If you listen to me on Series 6 MNBA Radio, Sundays, 10 to 1 Eastern with Jason Jackson absolutely man thanks again and for you people at home uh remember that the show is available in audio podcast format no reason to miss it tap in with us 
on the NBA Report. Great show. And we'll see you guys uh, later this week. We'll see you guys on Wednesday, man. Peace.